welcome to New Hope Community Church. It is great to have you with us today. Thanks for being here. If you are visiting the New Hope for the very first time, you honor us with your presence and your choice today. There's a visitor card in the front uh, of where you're seated. I would love for you to take it out, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by in a little while. And then uh, next week through the mail, we will send you information that tells you about New Hope. We promise. We will not beat on your door. We will not bother you on the phone. But through the mail, we'll send you information. We hope we'll answer most of your questions about what goes on around New Hope. The other side of that card is for all the rest of you. If you have messages to the staff, prayer requests, things that we need to remove from the bulletin, uh, please uh, indicate that on the card. Drop it in the offering bag. And we will attend to it as quickly as we possibly can. Let me highlight uh, a few announcements and then some prayer requests, and uh, we got a short little video clip to share with you today, and then we will get engaged in our worship uh, as soon as we can right after that. So let me uh, take care of a couple of the announcements. Uh, first off, tonight, 6 o'clock, we're going to have an evening event here in the sanctuary. This is Africa Night. Uh, if uh, you want to know about the trip that Lindsay and Katie and I took to the Ivory Coast of Africa, then come back at 6 tonight. We're going to share our stories and show you some pictures. And it'll uh, be about an hour. Hi, guys. How you doing? <laughs> okay. If you were busy, we wouldn't do that to you. But uh, uh, right. of course, if you were busy, you wouldn't have not walked right down the middle aisle. Either. <laughs> it's true. A man is not surprised by that. I really ought to be, I ought to be nicer to her husband, though. He got, uh, he's, an old, he's an old rock musician, so he can handle it. But he does, not, he does not sing or look as pretty as she does. No, just, all right? But he does play. He, he does play. He's got a drum. All right? So he does good. Uh, so anyway, that's the night from 6 to about 7 we are going to have, uh, it's kind of hot like dessert, going to be very casual, after we have our time in here we'll go over to the Burbot building and sit down and uh, break some, uh, uh, some, some bread together, alright, uh, really sweet stuff. Uh, that you're going to bring. <laughs> uh, it'll be really good if uh, somebody will bring something that, that, that's dairy-free, gluten-free, um, only because Shelly and I are on a 10-day uh, twins diet. Okay, uh, trying to find some of the things that trigger responses, you know, in your stomach occasionally, and so we're going through this 10-day cleanse. I'm trying to be a supportive. We went to a marriage conference last weekend, so I'm trying to be a supportive husband here. I got to I got to Confession's good for the soul, babe, so I'm going to confess you. Um, <laughs> she's struggling, man. She says, I can't have that either. <laughs> so, yeah, but anyway, so, so right in the middle of this plan, we're planning a, a church dessert. That, 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 that was really supportive of me. But anyway, we're going to do that tonight, so come and join us. Uh, let's see here. This Friday night, we're going to have a drive-in movie night out in the parking lot. All right? Just like the old drive-in. Big screen's going to go up uh, right at dusk. I think that's probably around 7.15. My guess is right now when time change for so anywhere somewhere in that neighborhood they'll uh, they'll be refreshments that you all can uh, get uh, you can get the sound through your car radio or you can sit out by your car and they'll have speakers up so that'll be Friday night right about dusk and uh, they'd love to have you now if it rains it's canceled okay hey if this man, anything to motivate rain okay <laughs> but uh, the rain be canceled now the 22nd this is very very short notice. We normally advertise this a month out, but man, we look at the calendar and we just don't have a month out. And we don't have a free Saturday except for this one coming up. So we are having our spring clean up Saturday this Saturday. And, and I know everybody's going to say, oh man, I already had plans. <clears throat> Tell the truth. <laughs> Anywhere from 7 a.m. to 12 noon. All right? Anytime you can come in there, you don't have to be here for 7 a.m. You don't have to leave at 12. You can be here for an hour, you can be here for two hours, you can be here for all five hours, but uh, <clears throat> we're just going to do a spruce up. This is inside and out. Uh, with the last rains we got, we didn't have any weeds for the last rains. Now we got weeds, and they are also in the horseshoe pit, and we need that for the first week of April, all right? So, if you could come and help out in any way, bring your tools, bring it on, things like package, hose, uh, weed eaters, whatever you got, we'll probably put it to use at some point, someplace, all right? So that's 7 to 12 this Saturday, all right? We like it to look good for Easter around here. 
Uh, annual pie auction, last Sunday of the month, two weeks from the night. One of our most fun events every year. Uh, if you've been here, you know all about it. If you do, uh, we, we raise funds for our, our high school Mexico mission trip that takes place Easter week. And uh, we, we, we do an auction here in the sanctuary, and what we auction is home-baked stuff, all right? Or the promise of home-baked stuff, all right? Like Dad serving 12 for uh, chicken and dumplings, all right, at your house, okay? Um, but man, if you bring your best-baked pie, your best-baked cobbler, your best-baked lasagna, well, whatever it is that you do, man, you bring it, and we auction it off. We do it for about an hour and a half, as, as fast and as hard as we can go. I got to take it to give it to we're not doing that because we can't do it anymore. And we have a lot of fun around here. So come join us that night. Bring your stuff and bring your checkbooks because it doesn't work without either one of them. Uh, all right. Uh, a couple of prayer requests. And then after the prayer requests, I want to show you the video. All right? So I've got to give those guys a heads up. Uh, the Tim Bain family, that was yesterday's memorial service that was here at the church. Please remember that. We have a 23 year old son and 16 year old daughter. Uh, Tim was 49. Uh, I discovered something. I don't think in all the memorial services and stuff I've done over the years, I don't think I've ever done a service for a Tim before. It's a, it's, it's a little, yeah. <laughs> this Tim is saying that's good. It's just, it's a little strange saying your own name, all right? It really is. It kind of has a little impact, particularly when you identify it, all right? We're about the same age. Um, uh, it really is hard. Yeah. Uh, what, he's 49. Uh, we're in the same ballpark. <laughs> I'm just way out in the outfield, all right? We're in the ballpark. Uh, the Helen Barnes family, that service was earlier in the week, so please remember the Barnes family. It was not a family. Uh, that was at the end of the previous week. And then this coming Tuesday, uh, the Susano family. Uh, the you know, uh, Susano, Western Ware, downtown Clovis. A uh, fourth generation in the Western Ware business in Clovis. So, Long time Columbus resident. He was a former, um, um, uh, yeah, what do you call the guys from League of Parade? Grand Marshal. Grand Marshal, thank you. Former Grand Marshal of the Rodeo, uh, Rodeo Parade. And this year, for the 100th anniversary celebration of the Rodeo, all the present living former Grand Marshals were going to be the Grand Marshal this year. And there was 13 of them. And they were going to ride together on a float at the, the, the head of the parade. Now there will be 12 with an empty chair uh, representing less. And so that's what they do remember his sons and their families. They would appreciate that so much. Dick Allen is in the hospital. Uh, he and his wife are a couple who usually sit right about in there. They've been married 72 years. He's had some kidney failure. He is undergoing treatment right now. He is progressing, but very slowly. We remember him. Ed Dunnington was in the Heart Hospital for five days this week. He is better. He was in our 8 o'clock service this morning. So uh, continue to pray for, for Ed's health. Um, we're starting a sermon series today. It's four weeks long. It's going to coincide with our small group Bible study that we kicked off. We've got about 210 uh, people in our church who are in small groups. We've had our second launch for this year. Uh, our second launch this year. It's our second year in a row. And uh, for the first Bible study on the launch, we all do the same. The same one. And each Sunday from now till uh, four Sundays from now, we're going to be tied in uh, with that same study. You don't have to go to small group for the service to make sense, but we hope that uh, there'll be some some really good perspective shared between the two. Uh, we're going to show you just a brief clip from the Bible study. It's called Unstuck. It's being taught by four different people. You'll see each of them in this clip. Uh, it also connects to a movie that you're going to hear about in here. And uh, at the end of April, and there'll be more information coming, at the end of April, we're going to have another Sunday night event, and we're going to show the movie, Journey to Yama, in its entirety. All right? And, there'll be a, and this is just an incredibly good movie inspired by World Vision. And you'll hear a little bit about it in this clip. So let's kick back and watch this clip. In just, it's two minutes, ten seconds. Let's go. We've all had those moments where we feel trapped by life, feel like we're stuck in a rut. It's a war. The rejections uh, I got it was too much. I was very bitter. I kind of just threw everything out the window in regards to what I believed in. I came to a point after four years of being here where all of that was just not making me happy. I just remember falling hard and then 
I began to pray. She said, you go to your God, you fix this. I think God used the curiosity inside of me of wanting to know where my son was um, to lead me to his loving heart. I came com completely convicted that my circle of influence was too small, that there were people around me that were hurting to know Jesus. I didn't see him. I was too busy. We're going to focus on how to become unstuck, on how to see our lives and the world around us as God sees them. It seems like the same question that's asked over and over is, why? What the Bible teaches is that consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. Well, our Savior is redemptively inclined toward prodigals, toward people like us. And let's be honest, y'all, every single one of us is prone to wander. God is not done with you. Your story isn't over. We have to see our lives in light of God's bigger plan, and we have to understand how our story intersects with the big story that God is writing. We'll start each session by watching part of the award-winning film, The Journey to Jamal. This film was produced and filmed by Michael Landon Jr. and Brian Bird for World Vision and was inspired by the real-life story of Margaret and Derek, two orphaned children from Uganda who made a journey across the country in a heartbreaking bid to overcome poverty and experience hope. It's time to make a difference. It's time to care. It's time to act. That's how we get unstuck. So that is what our small groups are starting. They either started last week or they're starting this week. And uh, we're going to be looking at unstuck. I love the one lady's comment where she said, I realize my sphere of influence is too small. And I hope that's a realization that most of us would come to, that our sphere of influence <coughs> We've allowed to become too small. We can choose to make a difference, and I hope that we will. I don't know how many of you noticed anything new in the sanctuary when you arrived today. Did anybody notice? Yeah. What did you see? Yeah, the sound group back there. All right, just got in this week. Uh, I want to say thanks to a couple of folks. All right, uh, Michael Jackson, would you please stand? Uh, Michael Jackson, he is a uh, he is a finished cabinet maker, and it is obvious by the finished product back there. Uh, and so, since he did this for free, uh, if you have a job that pays, uh, give him a call. All right, that would be absolutely great. He's good at what he does. So, thank you, David Dunlap. You were in here for that. David, stand up, please. David back there. David. Contacted him because he loves fitting with wood, and he said, "Oh, we need to get Mike in this." And so uh, the two of them uh, are the ones who built all of that. And then the stain work turned out just beautiful, matches the pews, and that's uh, that's thanks to Glenn Matson. All right, Glenn Matson. Hard work. Uh, we're going to take a moment just to do something also a little different. Uh, uh, I want to recognize somebody in this. Oh, before I do that. Natalie, would you stand briefly, just quick, turn, take a little pirouette so everybody can see you, turn around. It is her birthday today! for several weeks now, so welcome home, dear. Thanks for sharing your birthday with us today. And actually, I know sooner I would have had a present for you. <coughs> So I, I'll give you a kiss after the service. <laughs> Good. But I want to recognize one other person today. Yeah. Uh, this person has no idea they're going to be recognized today. I love surprises. <laughs> um, I, I want to recognize someone for their um, extended and excellent service for the sake of the kingdom. For over 25 years, this person served as a volunteer in women's ministry leadership in the state of California. She did this with the Conservative Baptist Churches of Northern California. This is a group of 125 churches throughout California and Nevada. 
The primary job of this women's ministries was to plan and to organize several women's conferences every year at a campground called Silver Spur. Some of you ladies have been there for retreats already. For many years, she served on the retreat committee in a variety of capacities. She led workshops. She became a retreat coordinator, taking on even more responsibility. And along with that job, she eventually became a part of the board of directors for the entire camp facility. She was finally chosen to be president of the ministry, and she served in that role for several years. The church association recently decided to have Silver Spur staff handle all of the retreats, including the women one, resulting in this board of women being retired. At this previous year's final retreat, she and others were honored at Silver Spur in a special ceremony, and they were given recognition. Today, we want to recognize that woman from our church who invested so much for so many, not just New Hope, but for the kingdom's sake, we want to recognize Kathy Lewis. Kathy. say thanks for your engagement, your involvement. You made an impact on hundreds and thousands of women over all the years, uh, both collectively as a board as well as personally in your teaching and your availability. You make a difference around here as you and your husband that made it possible for us to launch small groups by starting the first one in your home. You have set a standard that is exceedingly high because everybody wants to know can we have desserts like Kathy Lewis. <laughs> <clears throat> and she will have some at the pie auction, okay? Just thought I might add. So, Kathy, we have a note. Usually we let people open their own cards, okay? Uh, I, I thought about having a big bouquet of flowers here, okay, to hand to you. But they would just wither and die, okay? And they would go away. So, we have a card here, and it says, A prayer for one who serves faithfully, okay? And it says, whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. Lord, thank you for the way your love shines through your servant and lights up our lives. God bless you as you faithfully serve the Lord. You have faithfully and joyously served the Lord in your home, in your church, and in the community at large. And you've done it for the sake of the kingdom. You are loved and appreciated. Pastor of New Hope Community Church. And we have $100 gift cards for you, and you can take whoever you would like to the Daily Grind, all right? I mean, excuse me, Grill. Daily Grill. Daily Grill. The Grind may be who you take with you, all right? But it's, so, so, it is our thanks, Miss Kathy. Thank you for your service. have to stay over for the next service so we can do this again. <laughs> you will not be surprised in that one, all right? But but you must stay so yes, we can do this. Would you join with me as we pray? 
A father is great to share life with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is indescribable. When, when we share life with Jesus, we get all that he is, not just a little bit now, a little bit next week, a little bit next month, and maybe a little more next year. That's how much of us that we usually give to him. It's a little now and a little later, but but our Father, when your Son comes to live with us, He brings all that He is into our life. The Bible describes Him as the one who is the Prince of Peace. The Bible describes Him as the one who is joy unspeakable. The Bible describes Him as the one who is the light of the world. The Bible describes Him as the one who brings contentment in spite of our situations or our circumstances. The Bible describes him as the bread of life, for we will never spiritually hunger again. The Bible describes him as the living water, where we will never spiritually thirst again. And so, our Father, we thank you for the incredible gift of God, your Son. And Father, forgive us at the times that we give so little of ourselves to him, when he has given all of himself to us. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing today with our tithes and our offerings, a testimony that you can do more with our less than we can do with our all. It's the evidence that we also believe in your resurrection. So we say thank you for that privilege. Dear Father, for the needs that we've already expressed here today, we know infinitely more about them than we do, and we surrender them to you. And if you want to use us to be your hands, your feet, your lips of service and care, then may you find us available to do so. For those needs which have been unexpressed today, but are still just as real and, and just possibly difficult and, 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 and hurtful as any others are, may, may all of us surrender those to you with absolute confidence in your provision in the name of you. We surrender the rest of this service to you. May your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I invite you to take your Bibles, if you would, please, and find the book of James. And there could not have been a better song than what we just sang as an introduction for what we're going to be talking about out of the book of James. James chapter 1. We're going to be looking at Unstuck, the theme of the Bible study we're doing in our small groups, Unstuck, the sweet fruit that comes from bitter times. Unstuck, sweet fruit that comes from bitter times. Follow along with me, if you would please, as we read out of the book of James, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and a footnote, the half-brother of Jesus. Same mother, different father. <coughs> to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, consider it pure joy, or count it pure joy. Same, same word, two different translations. Consider or count it pure joy, my brothers, and he also means the sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I want to pause right there for just a moment. I want to read verse 4 in the New King James and King James Version, all right? Because there's, there's a phraseology I really like in the King James versus the NIV on verse 4. It says it this way. But let patience... God, you guys are quick back there. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and entire or complete, lacking or wanting nothing. Remember the but let, all right? That's important. Let's go on, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. He gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. The one, the man or the woman, should not think they will receive Nothing from the Lord, for if you do, you are a double-minded person, unstable in all of the ways. The brother or the person in humble circumstance ought to take pride in your high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in your low position. 
because you will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. And in the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man or the woman who perseveres under the trials. Because when you have stood the test, you will receive the crown of life that God has promised to who? Oh, it's not up there. No, you read around the Bible, read it out loud with me. He's made this promise to those who love him. If you've been here a while, you've probably heard this story. I shared it many years ago, but it's appropriate for the way we start today. The story about Chippy. Chippy is a little parakeet. Chippy never saw this day coming. One second, he was peacefully perched in his cage. The next, he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problem began when Chippy's owner decided to take a shortcut cleaning Chippy's cage. She decided to use a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and she stuck it into the cage. The phone rang and she turned to pick it up. She just barely said hello when <laughs> Chippy was sucked into the vacuum. The bird owner gasped. She put down the phone, she turned off the vacuum, she opened the bag, and there was Tippy, all in one piece, still alive, but stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him, she raced to the bathroom, she turned on the faucet, she held Tippy under the water, and then realizing that Tippy now soaked was also chippery. <coughs> She did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for her hair dryer, <laughs> blasted her pet with hot air. <coughs> Poor Chippy. He never knew what hit him that day. <laughs> A few days after the trauma, the reporter who had initially written about this event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> he just sits and stares. <laughs> it's, it's hard not to see why. Sucked in, washed up, blown over. That's enough to steal the song from the stoutest part. Maybe that sums up how many of us have felt the one time we met. It could possibly sum up the way you even feel today. It describes the certainty of trials and the feelings of powerlessness that trials and tragedies and troubles bring our way. There was an army chaplain who had a sign on his door that said, if you have troubles, come in and tell me about them. If you don't have troubles, come in and tell me how you do it. <laughs> James. Chapter 1 reminds us of the reality that even in the life of a Christian, there are trials and tragedies and temptations. Some of you have just come out of a moment like that. Some of you are in a season like that right now. And if you're not right now, and it's been a while in the past, you just wait a little longer. I have good news for you. There's a trial or a trouble or a tragedy just around the corner. We can count. However, those of us who are believers in Christ, we do not have to be a victim of the circumstances of the tragedies. James is telling us that there is a way that we can have victory in the midst of the trials and the testings. James tells us no matter what's going on outside of us, we can experience victory inside of us through our faith in his older brother, Jesus Christ. As you hear me reflect about James chapter 1 today, I want you to think about a question. I want you to think about how do you respond when life hands you a lemon? How do you respond when life hands somebody you know a lemon? 
Maybe it's even appropriate to ask how do you respond when you realize somebody you don't even know is handed a lemon, a sour time, a difficult one. In these verses that we read in the book of James, he gives to us four essentials for experiencing victory in the troubled moments of our life. The first one is count. Count or consider it all joy. See, what he's wanted us to do is take some important considerations. Think through so that before those moments ever come, we can enter those trials with a joyful attitude so that as we go through them, it, it persists in us as we go through the process. Number two, he tells us there's some things that we ought to know. We, we need a mind that understands the truth of what God has to say. Number three, that's the reason I read verse four in the King James Version is let, but let. Let is giving God permission to be at work in our life in the midst of those trials and tragedies. That is a surrendered will. So we're dealing with attitude, mind, and will here. And then last of all, he says ask in verse 5. Ask. And this is a heart that chooses to believe that we can ask God for his promise to be fulfilled in us in the midst of the trial. So let's jump in and look a little closer at these four things that are essential for victory in preparation for and in the midst of the trials and the tragedies of our life. First word is count. A joyful attitude. James 1, 2 says, Consider it or count it pure joy, my brothers, my sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. This word count, it's an accounting term, all right? Is, is it hot to anybody else in here? No. Okay, the cooler's on on this side. It is not on. Just the inside cooler to the one to your left. Yeah, turn it to cool, about 70 or 72. If that doesn't work, I'm, I'm shedding coat. Okay. I'll keep my pants on, but I'm tight. <laughs> this, this word here is translated count or consider. It's really an accounting term. It, it's a term that means to take stock of, investigate your inventory, consider it carefully, investigate fully, line up all the information, see if it all adds up. What kind of things are you and I supposed to consider in the midst of a trial or in preparation of the one that's around the corner? First of all, I think we must consider the facts about our trials. James does not say, first of all, if trials come, does he? Because <laughs> folks, they are coming. That is a fact you can count on. You will have challenges in this life. Just in the prayer request time, we share with you trials that other people are facing. Expect them. Do not hide your face in the proverbial sand. Notice that just because we are believers in Jesus Christ, we are not exempt from problems. And any preacher that tells you so, turn him off. Okay? Turn him off. Do not send him any money. There's better places for your money to go than to that kind of preacher. Okay? Jesus is honest. In this world, you will have trouble. Satan fights us. The world opposes us. And this makes this life full of battle. Not, to, not only should we consider the facts about trials, but we ought to consider the fact that there are many different types of trials. They won't all be the same in your life. You think, wow, I've got this one down, the next one will be different. You can count on that fact. There are many different kinds of trials. This can refer to at least two different things. First, it can refer to the types, emotional, work-related, physical. You can go on and add all kinds of descriptive words. Or it can refer to the source of trials. Trials generally come from two sources. They are the trials that we experience as the result of living a Christian life. In fact, this is probably what James had in mind when he wrote this letter. Because his audience is described to us in verse 1 of chapter 1. is to the 12, 12 tribes that are scattered throughout the world. He was addressing those believers who have been uprooted from their homes and their families just because they were believers in Jesus Christ. They were ostracized by their families. They were, they were kicked out of their communities. They, are, they were arrested because of their faith. And in some cases, they were executed because of their faith. 
The Christian World Report, less than two years ago, said that in China alone, 1,100 people are executed monthly just because they profess faith in Jesus Christ. It's astounding. We just heard in our small group Bible study last Tuesday night. Um, the Belcher's daughter, Jen, was here today. We're going to pray for her before we leave the service today. because She leaves tomorrow to go back to uh, Africa, Uganda. Yeah. For the movie, all right? Journey to Jamaa with Bay, all right? And uh, her last trip, she came back to the U.S. by way of, of uh, Syria. They went to the concentration camps, the holy camps, for people who were fleeing uh, their areas because of battles that are going on. They're searching for answers, but if you profess Jesus Christ publicly, you, in the past, have been arrested. Those who live in the country have been executed. It still takes place. You and I are far from that. And I guess we can be grateful. But at the same time, to know that our brothers and sisters of faith are facing that kind of persecution. Those kind of trials and tragedies ought to stir our hearts. They identify with what James is writing as he writes to a group of folks who've been scattered, persecuted, experienced trials and tragedies because of their faith in Jesus Christ. For the most part here in the Western world, we have it pretty cozy. Our trials come from another source. They're usually unknown and unexpected experiences of life. For the most part, people don't have control over these experiences. No one can predict or control a hijacking of four airplanes and one of them crashing into the Trade Center and one into the Pentagon. Other kinds of trials that are unexpected are tsunamis and hurricanes and tornadoes and car wrecks. Mass murder. We can't plan those. We're not prepared for them, but they come our way. So not only do we uh, consider the facts about trials, not only do we consider that they come in many different ways, but we also should consider in advance of trials in our life, what should our response be? How should we respond when we answer the phone and we get the news we never wanted to hear? What do we do when we answer the door and we hear someone tell us something that we never, ever wanted to experience? How do we handle something when we open the paper and we read something that is so catastrophic, so devastating that it shakes us to our very core? What should our response be? James, James tells us. He says, count it joy when you face them. Not that you're happy about what happened, but count it joy that in you there was someone bigger than yourself to face these challenges and these trials with. The Apostle Peter said it this way, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery trials that you were going through, as if something strange or peculiar was happening. Instead, be glad, rejoice, because these trials will make you partners with Christ in his suffering. And after it is over, you will have the wonderful joy of sharing his glory when it is displayed to all of the world. Warren Wearsby, one of my favorite preachers, he made this observation about the trials of life. He said they're not all alike. They are like multicolored yarn that the weaver uses to make a very beautiful rug. God arranges and mixes the colors of the experiences of our life, and the final product is a beautiful thing regarding his glory. If we're going to let God take all the tapestry of our lives and weave them together into something that displays his character to our world, you and I must evaluate our priorities, both our past and our present priorities. What are they? Do we count in joy for Jesus? Is he preeminent in our life? We must make a decision if we're going to live for things which matter most or if we're going to live for the moment. We must decide what our values are. And you see, our value determines our estimation of things. So if our value is Christ, we can find joy in the trials and the tragedies. But if our value is found in something else, then there's no way the joy will be real. If we value comfort more than character, then every little bit of trouble will upset us. 
If we value the physical and the material more than the spiritual, we will not be able to count our trials and troubles as joy. If we live for the present and not for the eternal, then trials will make us bitter rather than better. If I was going to consult an expert about surviving trials and tragedies, Job might be the choice. If you don't know about Job, go read the Old Testament book of Job. It won't take you two chapters to find out. Job is an expert on tragedy. Swift. You want to talk about chippy. You want to talk about getting sucked in, washed up, and blown over. Job would know that. And listen to what he says towards the end of his book. He said, when God has finished with me, I will shine as gold. <coughs> trials come, don't pretend. Don't try self-hypnosis. Simply look at the trial through the eyes of faith. You will come out shining as gold. You see, outlook determines outcome to end with joy. We must begin with joy, and that starts with Christ. How is it possible to rejoice in the midst of our trials? That's where point number two. First one was count. Second one is know. Verse three, we must have an understanding mind about the truth of God. What do we as believers know that makes a difference when we face trials so that we benefit from them rather than get destroyed by them? Our faith is going to be tested. If we want our faith to grow, it must face tests. I try to find a delicate word in the o'clock service to illustrate this. If we want our flat to get unflattened, <laughs> can we sit on the couch? Yeah. We have to exercise it. Okay? You have to be willing to put your muscles to a test if they're going to get stronger. If you are a runner, you have to test your lung capacity. You have to run so it hurts. You have to learn where second wind comes from. That doesn't happen by not ever running. Faith does not get strengthened if it is never Tested. It must be tested. God tests our faith to bring out the best in us. Because who does God know lives in each of us if we are his child? That's not a trick question. Jesus, good. Anytime a preacher asks a question in church, 98% of the time, the answer will be Jesus. 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 Yeah, good. All right. All right. Jesus. Good. You're with me. But Jesus cannot shine as gold in our life if the knowledge of our faith is not tested. God tests to bring out the best. Satan tempts to bring out the worst. I'm going to apologize in advance. But I usually annoy people with what I'm about to say. But I'm sorry. It is the truth. It's not a truth we like to think about. It's a truth we just like to keep shelves in the back of our head. But, but you and I have a choice to make. That will bring us to the third point in just a minute. But, but with what we know, we have a choice to make. God tests for our best. Satan tempts for our worst. You and I have a choice to make with the knowledge that we have, and that is, are we going to act and choose like our birth father, spiritually, or like our heavenly father, our adopted father? See, in the spiritual realm, there's only two choices of who your father is. It's either Satan or it's God. The 
Bible says when we are born physically, how are we born spiritually? Dead in our trespasses and our sins. <coughs> Whose character is that? That is the character of Satan. The devil, the evil one. He is our spiritual father until we come to a place in our life that we are born again. again. And now we have an adopted father. One who adopts us out of the misery of our previous existence and brings us as an inheritor of all that he is. And we become God's child. We pass from death to life. We pass from Satan being our father to God being our father. I know it. I was never a child of Satan. I was never a devil worshiper. You are the perfect child of Satan. To deny that that was ever true. And we do not appreciate the finished work of Jesus on a cross unless we understand that what he did on a cross was to snatch us out of the grasp of our, of our spiritually natural father and we were adopted by his own daddy. You and I are his child. Satan draws attention to us when we become God child. Why? Because he wants to expose the worst of us so that we will reject the best of what God has. Testing works for us, not against us when we know. 1 Peter 1, 7 says, the testing of your faith, the approval of your faith. For what purpose? To prove that your faith is genuine. And not, not a fake and not a phony. These trials are <coughs> only to test our faith, to show that our faith is strong and pure. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. And our faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. So if your faith remains strong after being tested by fiery trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day that Jesus Christ is revealed to the entire world. A gold prospector brings his ore sample to the, uh, to the uh, assay office, and it's there to be tested. And the sample itself may be very small, so it won't be worth a whole lot of money. But the approval of the quality of that gold, the official statement about that ore, is worth millions. It assures the prospector that he has a gold mine. God's approval of our faith is precious because it assures us that our faith in him is our gold mine. And it's now stamped. Everything in the mind is yours. Everything that is God, when he is our adopted father, it becomes ours. Trials rightly used bring maturity to us. Trials squandered keep us in our immaturity. How does God spell maturity? Patience, perseverance, endurance, the ability to keep going when the circumstances are impossible. Let me illustrate maturity this way. You're taking your kids to Disneyland. You've got them in the car and you're pulling out the driveway. What's one of the first questions your kid asks you? Are we there? hadn't even got to the end of the block. All right? And what, they do not, immature people are often impatient. They are too immature to understand the journey. And in our spiritual life, there is a journey as well. We often want the blessings of maturity without walking the road of growth. And on that road, there will be trials. The only way God can develop patience and character in our lives is through these trials. We can't develop this just by reading books about it. We can't do it just by having prayer. We can't do it just by being part of a Bible study. You can't do it by just enduring sermons. <laughs> None of those are bad. All those do is to help prepare us for the moment when the real test comes. We must have the trials. That is how you and I can face trials with a positive attitude because we know when the next one comes, God is going to prove our faith genuinely in Him. And it's going to be for our benefit. Number three, let. Verse 4, verses 9 to 11. But let patience finish its work. So we may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Verse 9, the brother in humble, humble circumstance, take pride in your position. But the one who is rich, take pride in your low position, because you will pass away like a wildflower. 
The sun rises without scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. And in the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. God cannot and will not build our character without our cooperation. God is a gentleman. He will not push or prod or drag our wills. I wish he would, but he doesn't. If we resist him, the natural consequence will be his chastisement and discipline in our lives. However, if we submit to him, then he can accomplish his work and we can count it joy. God's goal for our lives is maturity, shaped and formed into the image of his dear son who lives within us. It would be tragic if our little children remained babies all of their lives. We enjoy watching them grow through the stages of life. There are times when we naturally want to shelter our kids from dangers, but we can't. I was reminded of that just Friday night. My baby boy is 30 years old. <laughs> I was 12 when I followed him. <laughs> That's bad. Grown man. Works at Clovis East. He's living out the dream of his life. He's going to coach varsity baseball. Friday night, his first game against his arch enemy when he played high school baseball. Clovis. <laughs> Unless you're a cougar, everybody hates the cougar. It's true. 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 They do. They were good for so long. <laughs> and he faced it. And it was, a, it was a competitive game to the top of the last inning. And then they killed him. Then I sat in the stand and watched. We're both at the I feel sorry for my mother. I didn't look over and said, I feel sorry for my mother. I'm sitting there thinking, I wish I could trade places with him. But you see, here's what I know. He's living his dream. He wants to be a good, mature, strong, successful coach. He has got to endure the losses with character. So that he knows what to do with the things when they come. And I can't do it for him. He's got to do it himself. God, our Father, says, hey, there's a lot I can do for you, but I can't do anything for you until you, what's the word? Let. Until you let me. Let me. God does not work in us without our consent. We must surrender our will to his. If we face trials without a surrendered will, we will remain in the church. <coughs> James 9 through 11 explores this truth with two classes of Christians, the poor ones and the rich ones. Okay? And, and maybe what he's trying to do is to correct our view of what blessings are. Okay? We think rich people, no problem. Okay? Great. That life with no problems would be wonderful, right? But no, no. That's all right. Because you won't mature if you don't have the trials. The idea of rich and poor, too, they may have a wrong view. Remember the rich young ruler in Matthew 19? Came to me, what must I do to be saved? And he said, you know, you, know, you need to worship God. Well, I do that every Sabbath. Well, you must, you must follow the commandments. Oh, I do that to the, to, 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 to the, to the very letter. He said, okay, then go sell everything that you only do to the poor and come and follow me. And Jesus, Jesus was not saying to this rich man, the way you should become a Christian is by selling everything and taking the vow of poverty. What Jesus did with that man is he dealt with the God who sat on the throne in his life. And he said, there's not room for me on that throne as long as your money sits on the throne. And scripture says, the rich man walked away sad. So what's the right view of blessing in life? The fact that we have a lot, so that we can count it joy that we have little. The fact that we have no problems with the fact that we can count it joy when we face fiery trials of any kind from any <coughs> God's testing has a way of leveling us all. It's not our material resources that are going to get us through the trials of life, but it's the spiritual resources that Christ brings to us. Sometimes God uses the trial of tragedy and suffering to pose to us a question, who do you love more? Do you love your job more than me? Do you love your hobbies more than me? 
Do you love your home more than me? Do you love your spouse and your child more than me? He pushes us to get us focused on things that are eternal. And tragedy can oftentimes put us in a better spiritual position to focus. And then last of all, he says, ask. Ask. A heart that wants to believe in Jesus Christ. When unexpected trials land on our doorstep, how are we to respond? Pray! I, that ought to be our first response. you got to program, you got to tell yourself, I need to pray about everything. And so then when the unexpected things come, pray. But then the second question is, what do I pray for? James tells us. What did he tell us? Pray. Pray for what? Wisdom! Who said that? If I had a prize up here, I would give it to you. Okay. Uh, so imagine it to be whatever you want it to be, because that's what it is. No, I'm sure, right? Right. Wisdom. Wisdom is more than knowledge. Someone has said that knowledge is the ability to take things apart, and I do that really good. But they said that wisdom is the ability to put them back together. And I would add a little extra to that definition put it back together with no extra parts left over. Because <laughs> when I tear apart, I often have pieces left when I put it back together. Wisdom is using knowledge rightly. Why do we, we pray for, for more wisdom, but you and I have a tendency and in our current culture, we have a tendency when we pray is to pray for power or strength or deliverance. <coughs> we need wisdom so that we will not waste the opportunities that God has given us to mature. Wisdom helps us to use these circumstances for our good and God's glory. Some of you have heard this, but it's great here. One day a farmer's mule fell into his well. The animal cried piteously for hours as the farmer tried to figure out how am I going to get him out. Finally, he decided the animal was old. It was costing him more money than he was worth, and the well needed to be covered up anyway. So he invited all of his neighbors to come over to help him. They all grabbed a shovel and they began to shovel dirt into the well. At first, the donkey realized what was happening. He cried horribly, eh, 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 or something like that. <laughs> then everyone's amazed. The mule quieted down. A few shovel loads later, the farmer finally looked down in the well. He was astonished at what he saw. With every shovel of dirt that hit his back, the donkey was doing something amazing. He would shake, the dirt would land on his back, he would shake it off, and then he would step up. More dirt would land on his back, and he would shake it off, and he would step it up. He did that all the way until he walked out right over the top of that well and headed to the pasture. The moral of that story is life is going to shovel dirt on our backs, all kinds of dirt. And the key to getting out of the well is to shake it off and step it up. Shake it off and step it up. Each one of our troubles is a stepping stone of maturity. Shake it off and step it up. Don't waste the opportunities when God gives them to us to prove himself. Wisdom moves us from asking why to asking why don't I do something. James tells us what to pray for. Wisdom. He says you can do it confidently, specifically, and unwaveringly. When we do, God promises to answer this prayer for wisdom. He will do it generously to anyone who asks, and he'll do it without finding fault. He won't say, why didn't you ask me the last time? If you ask, he will give you his wisdom. No need to be anxious. God is excited to answer. So, let's wrap this up. What's in it for me? If I count it joy, if I know the truth, if I surrender my will and let him have his way, and what will happen if I ask for wisdom? Scripture says in verse 12, Blessed is the man, the woman who perseveres under trial, because when you stood the test, you will receive the crown of life. It's promised to those who love him. What's the motivation? Our love for him. There are some of you men in here who have gone through many chick flicks in your life. You never wanted to see one of them. But you went blind. Don't say because Joe Grizzle said you should. You went because you love your woman. Some of you ladies, 
have gone to NASCAR races. And they were amazing. I'm not even sure I can do that. Dizzy thing about that. But we do things, we sacrifice what they want because we love them. Love motivates a joyful attitude. Love motivates an understanding mind. Love motivates the surrender of my will to his. And love motivates belief that God, God will work this out. Where is your love found? God or in the world? What are you trusting in when the trials come? Good answer. God wants us to grow. And our love to Christ count no less ask. This is how we get unstuck from where we are. Choose to make a difference. And it starts with counting it joy. There's a story of a Scottish, Scottish discus thrower from the 19th century. He lived days before there were professional trainers, and he developed his skills alone in the highlands of his country. He made his own discus from the scripture that he read in a book. What he didn't know was that the competition discus was made of wood with the outer rim of iron. He made his discus of pure metal four times heavier than the one that his would-be challengers were throwing. He didn't know that. This committed Scotsman trained day after day after day, laboring under the burden of the extra weight of the discus he had made. He had marked in his practice area where the record throw was. And he kept working with that until he could get close to what the record for the discus toss was. He headed to the competition. They handed him an official wooden <laughs> discus. It felt like a tea saucer in his hand. At his very first competition, he set new records. And for many years to follow, no one could touch him. The moral of this story, train under a greater burden. Some of us are here today, you already under the burden. And it hurts and it's unpleasant. Sometimes we despair and we cry. Sometimes we're angry at the burden, but we must take heart. We must have this deep sense of joy because the burden is producing patience and patience, perseverance. Both of those are bringing maturity to our lives. Neither of these virtues so prized by God would be ours without the burden. Can't get unstuck? Count in all joy. Before I close this prayer, I'm going to ask Jen, if you would, just meet you right here in the center of the aisle, if you would, please. Jenny is one who also grew up not liking the Clovis Cougars. <laughs> She's a Buchanan graduate. All right. Yes, yes, you may applaud for that. Okay. Come on, Buchanan. Thank you. Uh, you know, love the Lord. She's part of a church that's in California called The Rock. Uh, her rock is Jesus Christ, and that's what takes her again and again and again. Um, she, along with some um, uh, other young ladies and young men, started an orphanage with the help of their church and others in Uganda. And uh, they don't do just an orphanage. They, they expose people to the love of Jesus Christ and takes her to places that are real dangerous. And uh, she's, she's, she's not the typical image of a warrior that uh, you would normally imagine, but she is one of God's warriors. And we just want to, she leaves tomorrow. Her parents are taking her to the airplane, and we just want to pray for her. She's heading back. So you've got a two, short trip this time, two weeks this time. And um, one of these days, we'll have her back on a Sunday night to share her stories with us, because she has a great one that I might tell before she gets a chance to, because uh, it has challenged me this week. All right, let's pray. Our Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your availability to us, for the the trials that even come our way because you won't waste them, whether they're trials that come from outside sources or come from sometimes our, our own decisions. But you promise that we can count it joy. If we pray for wisdom, you'll give to us gems. And you'll refine us like gold in the fire. Thank you for what you've been doing in Jenna's life. Thank you for the impact that she has made in the lives of her own family members. Thank you for the difference she's made for those that she works with. Thank you for the difference that she's made in a part of the world that so many know much about. For this trip, if she's going to be gone for two weeks this time, we pray that you will give her traveling stamina, strength beyond her own ability, 
trust when she gets there that she will be focused on the purposes that you want to accomplish through her life. May she know that you have wisdom and you will give it to her liberally. Thank you, Father, for her courage to make a difference in some of the least known parts of the world. We trust you in her. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Oh, Lord, I pray for her mom and dad while she's going. Give them peace and patience while they wait. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless you, my